So I'm here to talk about education. In particular, I have to talk about, I want to talk about urban education. And the only thing for me to really convey my feelings about how to improve urban education or about that area of study is to go back in my life and life's history. So can we go on a quick journey? So I grew up in Brooklyn and the Bronx, New York. Um, you know, cars playing hip hop driving by were my lullabies. And in that space and time, I came to really love where I came from. But about 10, 11 blocks away from where I lived were the housing projects. And I was told that, Chris, you're good, but them kids in the housing projects don't hang out with them. They're loud, they're abrasive, they don't want to learn, they are not who you want to be. And I, even then, was kind of like a scientist. So I was like, well, if everyone's saying this about them, they're not smart, and they're saying they're loud, maybe then loud people aren't smart. And I constructed a hypothesis around those folks. I tested my experiment. It kind of came to be when I saw them. Another really powerful experiment or observation I made was about rainbows. So you guys ever see a picture of a rainbow? Every time you see a picture of a rainbow, it's, a, it's over this like beautiful lagoon or like this like wonderful looking mountain piece, right? And so I had these theories about urban youth of color. I had these theories about rainbows. And my theory about rainbows was that the rainbows looked that pretty because the places where they flew over or where they were over were beautiful. I thought the rainbow's colors came from the places that the rainbow hovered over. So could you imagine my shock and surprise when one morning I look out and there is this perfectly shaped parabola in multiple colors over the housing projects. <laughs> Rainbows are not supposed to be made in those places. And so I started researching further about rainbows and I realized that rainbows don't care where you are or where you come from. Rainbows just need sunlight, droplets of water. The water refracts and reflects off the water drops, disperses a color around the top of the place and it's, and it's magical. So the rainbow just needs the perfect conditions to allow its brilliance to be expressed. It cares not where it happens. And I also realized that you could get a cup of water, a flashlight, and a mirror and make a rainbow in your living room. <laughs> so this like motivated me. I'm like, if the kids in the projects can make rainbows, then I want to work in education. So I decided to, you know, leave my science degrees behind and go into the classroom. I went to the classroom to teach. I started engaging with young folks from the same places that they said rainbows couldn't be built in. And as I'm engaging with them and talking to them, I'm seeing all these different forms of brilliance. And after this happens, I said, oh my gosh, I have to, I love the classroom. I have to leave the classroom and go to another platform so I can show the entire world that rainbows can hover over projects. And so I went to educational conferences. I put in a proposal. I went to speak and I was telling folks about all this magic I saw in the hood. And I looked out and there were two people. And then I turned the corner and this dude was up there and he had like 500 people talking to him and he's talking to them about the same topic, the same demographic, urban schools, youth of color. And as I'm hearing him talk and he's pretending as he has this, like he has this ethic of care about those young folks. But as I'm hearing him talk, I'm realizing this guy does not believe that rainbows can fly over projects. He said he cares about them, but he doesn't see the value in them. And that made me so mad, I started doing my homework. I wanted to find out where he taught, who made him so popping, why he got 500 people listening to him, because I needed to get that same platform to showcase the narrative that I experienced with those young folks. And so I did my homework and did my research. I found out that he worked at an Ivy League institution. I worked, I got a job at an Ivy League institution. I heard that he wrote articles in certain journals. I published in those very same journals. Man, I learned that he wrote a book. Shoot, I wrote a damn book. Like, you know, <laughs> now my, my title's a little different. And so all this happens, and then one day I'm home, and somebody writes a letter. And you know, it's a popping thing when it's not an email, it's like a letter. Nobody writes letters. I, I got this letter, and the letter said, Dear Professor Emden, you're invited to the organization's meeting with all these impactful educational researchers, and you're one of the select few who's invited to have a conversation with us around education. And so I'm like, yes, I'm in the club. 
And so I was so excited to go to this meeting, right? The day of the meeting, I am so nervous though that I couldn't eat anything. You ever been so nervous you can't eat? Because this is the day I was going to show these folks that there's, there's rainbows over projects, right? So I, I can't eat. I'm like, oh my gosh. And I'm studying all day. I'm sociology, ed theory, you know, uh, the politics of urban education. And I wanted to show them that I knew stuff. And by the time it hit like six o'clock, I felt so full with all the knowledge that I had that I was going to go in there and wow them and then introduce them to the stuff that I've been researching, right? I get there, 7 p.m. I walk into the event space and fam, it was beautiful. I'm talking about chandeliers. I'm like, I thought y'all were teachers. Like, this place is expensive. You know, <laughs> and it, it just looked majestic. And I walked in there ready to wow them. And they, I saw all these folks standing there and they're talking at research. And I walked in and, and I want to just pour out all the knowledge I knew. And then something struck me. You know what it was? Hunger. I didn't eat all day. So I'm sitting there hungry, like, oh my gosh, I need to eat. Now they're talking at theory, but I'm like, you know what, I need to eat. Once I eat, I'll feel better than I'll wow them with my brilliance, right? And, but there was no food. In fact, all they had was crackers and grapes. I'm like, yo, this ain't popping. Like, we can't get full of crackers and grapes, fam. So this all plays out. I didn't eat the crackers or grapes because it just wasn't food. And then they said, finally, dinner is served. And I'm like, yes, dinner is served. Woo, let's get it. So we sit at the table. Dinner is served. It's a nice place. They bring the food out. And, you, you know, they brought the food out around these ed researchers and policymakers. And I'm like, okay, guys, eat so I can eat. Then we can get this popping. None of them eat. <laughs> Apparently, they were full of the crackers and grapes and then <laughs> need to eat. And as I'm sitting there, the food is like right before my nose. I can smell it. And, but I, I'm so consumed of hunger, I can't engage. And I can hear in the backdrop and like a whisper, they're talking about research and urban youth and this and that. But the, I'm having a conversation with myself like, fam, you hungry, you need to eat right now. But I didn't eat at that moment because I didn't want to be the new invitee who was the first one to eat. Y'all feel me? So after a while I said, you know what? I'm going to just take this risk. I'm going to jump in. I'm, this is in, in my head. I'm going to jump in, I'm going to eat. And so it's almost like, you know, you know, first date, first kiss, you know you want to do it, but you're nervous. So what do you do, right? You count down. So I counted down in my head. I'm like, five, four, three, two, one. And at one, I looked down at the plate and this was the setting. Fam, there's four forks, five knives, three spoons. And I had never been to that fancier space. So although I wanted to engage, and I, I didn't want to be first the first person to eat. And second, I didn't know what the right fork was. I was going to get judged on that. <laughs> this had nothing to do with the fact that I was prepared. It had nothing to do with the fact that I spent my whole entire life believing in the fact that there are rainbows over housing projects. I was hungry. I didn't know the rules, and because of that, I didn't feel comfortable enough to share. This is the experience of young folks in urban classrooms today. It's not about their intelligence. It's not about their ability. It's not about their willingness to engage. It's all about the rules of engagement that we construct for them that have nothing to do with their brilliance and the fact that we attach what they naturally are to being anti-intellectual and anti-academic. The whole world of education is suffering from a disease called agnosia. If you're a medical doctor or if you're into neuroscience, you know agnosia. Agnosia is a condition where a human being can identify a phenomenon in the past and then after some, some sort of like lesion on a part of your brain, you can no longer see it. See, educators have agnosia in the sense that they have a cultural agnosia. They can recognize brilliance when it looks like them, but they can't identify it when it doesn't. And a cultural agnosia has permeated the field of education, particularly with youth of color. And it's so insidious that we don't even recognize that we have a disease. But guess what, y'all? I got a cure. Y'all want to hear the cure? Yeah. The cure is being ratchetemic. <laughs> y'all ain't ready. Now, ratchetemic is not in your dictionary. I started using it about seven years ago, and I think it's catching on. <laughs> ratchetemic is... Let me break it down like my English teacher used to. It is to be ratchet and academic. Now, who knows what it means to be ratchet? I know we're in a fancy smancy place, but some of y'all know what ratchet is. You ain't saying nothing. But to be ratchet is to, let me find, a, let me find an academic definition for ratchet. To be ratchet is to, <clears throat> to exemplify all negative characteristics associated with urban spaces, right? <laughs> to be loud, obnoxious. And, and you know, some of y'all are ratchet. Some of y'all have a ratchet friend. Some of y'all are the ratchet friend. 
But either way, Rashid exists, but also you can be academic and intellectual and be the pursuit of new knowledge. And we've constructed a scenario for young people that you either have to choose to be ratchet or academic. And because of that, they choose what's most comfortable and they believe it means that they can't be academic. So if we recreate new spaces in schools, y'all ain't with me, if you could create new spaces in schools to let young folks know that you could be equally as ratchet as you are academic. You could be as you are, but I want lower expectations. The rigor is still high, the standards are still high. But if you come in a little loud, that's okay. If if you dress a little funny, that's all right. If you speak with a voice inflection, that's okay. If, you, if you're an English language learner, you have a thick accent, that's okay. You can be who you are and I will accept you as you are, even if it makes me uncomfortable in the pursuit of our academic attainment. And to, <laughs> let me switch hats on y'all. Look, to be academic for me is to be hip hop. <laughs> to be academic is to exemplify hip hop ad. Now, Hip Hop Ed is a movement. It started online a couple years ago, but now we're moving. And Hip Hop Ed is to let young folks know that you could easily be as hip hop as you are intellectual. We have this logo emblazoned around t-shirts and hoodies for young folks to wear in their communities so they can show young people that look like them, that I am more than what you think I, you think I am, and we are more than what society thinks we are. When we do Hip Hop Ed, we created a project like Science Genius, where young people in New York City public schools, in advanced science classes, are not just taking tests at the end for them to forget later, but rather soaking in the information and then going through the critical process of constructing a rap around that knowledge. And then beyond that, when they write the rap around the knowledge, we engage them in competition with other kids. Why not have a science genius hip hop battle? And, and the winner of the science genius hip hop battle could go back to the hood like, yeah, I got bars, plus I'm scientific, dog what? <laughs> we wanna reimagine what this thing looks like by recreating educational spaces in a way that says, come as you are and be brilliant as you are. Now, if you come as you are and you ain't brilliant, you ain't down with hip hop ed. Y'all ain't with me. If you come as you are and you're only representing a trope or an image of what they say we are that doesn't represent who we are or a corporate and media saturated image of hip hop, we don't accept you. Because to be hip hop ed, you gotta be hip hop and popping academically and intellectually as well. And once we create these spaces for young people, they believe it. They hold on to it. They walk into this image here. If the winners of Science Genius from last year with their hip hop ed t-shirts in front of an Ivy League institution, posing in front of it like it's an album cover. <laughs> These things shape the identity. They, they shift your confidence. They move something in the depths of your soul and they help you to reimagine yourself to be in a way you've never seen before. So to close, I'm gonna have Dee come back out here. Dee, can you come back out real quick? I lost them, <laughs> it happens. To close, I'm gonna skip these slides, man, because my heart is so full. But that's, that's Jizza doing science in the hood. That's, that's Master P teaching math in the hood. Y'all ain't with me, hmm. huh? And, and that's D teaching public speaking and engagement in the hood, hmm. right? We, we respect teachers who have the credential, but we appreciate folks who have the love and passion for the work, and then we teach them to be teachers. So to close out, because I'm past my time, I want you to just say this with me to y'all. And can y'all repeat this after me? Can you repeat it after me, y'all? Yeah. I will not hide, hide my ratchet, ratchet self to make, make a broken system powerful. powerful. I, will I will not be made, made to be less than because I choose to be myself. I will not judge my brilliance by how I think it looks or sounds. sounds. I, will I will be equally as ratchet as, as academic. academic. And for my young folks in the hood, if you're watching this, when you make the wrong choice and they say, oh, you corny because you're going to school and being academic, I want you to remember that from this point on, we are Oreo no more. <laughs> we are teaching and being ratchetemic. Thank you. Ow!